That was his mm-hmm. mic. Hey, everyone. Are we ready? Um, so I like to think if, if Christian Rosenwald uh, held the release bacon for the last release of Selenium. So Selenium 2.21, he was the person that, that, that said, yeah, we can push this and we can make it go live. Um, you may have noticed it's been a long time between releases. That's because Christian was acting as the Jiminy Cricket, the good conscience of the project, um, and making sure that we crossed all the T's, dotted the I's, and just made sure the damn thing worked, right? Because it's always nice to get a release that's really good. Um, Christian's got a fantastic eye for detail, um, and he's passionate about quality. Um, And so I'm really looking forward to his uh, presentation on uh, building success on the foundations of mud. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Simon. You may get almost hard. Um, this presentation is all about practical stuff that happens in the enterprise from the trenches, so to speak. So there's no kittens. We keep them in other nicer places. Back when I was at the university about a thousand years ago, we had figures like this in software engineering textbooks about uh, how should a test environment look and how should it be uh, configured and set up in relation to your production environment. As we can see, uh, it was really easy back then. You had two boxes in test, two boxes in production. Uh, Since then, things have changed a little bit. Um, We still want to have some kind of similarity between between test and production. Uh, But the cloud has probably made it more interesting to have sort of like a function. You can say that your test environment is this kind of function of your production environment. If you are like Google and you have 10,000 nodes in production, Uh, you don't want to have 10,000 nodes in test. Or maybe you do, but um, you still want to keep that uh, aspect of reproducibility in your test environment. But unfortunately, they suck. There is always something wrong with your test environment. Uh, And uh, I've been working, I work as a consultant, and I've been working for different customers for a lot of years, and it's never any good. It's simply, that's the way things are out there. So you got the obvious ones, the hardware mismatches. Uh, since we introduced the cloud, it may not be that, that important, but obviously if you have like clustering in production and you don't have clustering in test, well, that's a problem. And there's the licensing stuff. You have that super expensive Oracle license, which someone sold you from Oracle that you, you could basically only afford that in production and maybe the pre-production site. But when it comes back to test, oh, we don't have that around here. Additionally, if you're in a reasonably large enterprise environment, you will be competing with 10, 15, 20 other projects uh, with access to test resources. At one level, that is systems. There are, um, if you're accessing other systems internal to your organizations, there's a risk that um, those systems may exist in different versions. And your project is using maybe 10 different systems, and there are simply not enough instances to cover all the needs that are used in the organization. So you'll have version mismatches too. Your test environment can be using different versions of some platforms. These are the real things that happen out there, unfortunately. And obviously there's the uh, uh, simpler things maybe, but latency, bandwidth differences, uh, production has that huge fat pipe and your test systems don't have the same kind of capacity. And as always, uh, for the last five years, we've done everything we can humanly do to get this right. But 10 years ago, we didn't. And 90% of your systems are 10 years old. So you have all that legacy to relate to, which is simply why it's not going to get that good. Uh, And you could, of course, suggest that you buy another one of those COBOL-based mainframes to get it for test. I'm sure you'll get laughs about that. Uh, you probably have, can't even buy half of them anymore. And your test data is not very good. Uh, if you're lucky, you have some kind of mechanism for transferring data from production to test, which means you can sort of have a fairly recent image of what is going on in your systems. Or you have anonymized snapshots, or you simply have different snaps, snapshots in different systems from different points in time. Uh, and all of this can make your tests, they can affect the realism of your tests and uh, what you're able to assert and verify. So while the subscriber 
of your product is actually dead in one system, he's still alive in another. And all, all these things, they, in one way, it's interesting because some of these inconsistencies exist in real life too. They may happen in production, but most of them don't. Most of them is just crap you have to relate to, which will make testing a lot harder and you'll spend a lot of hot air going after problems that are simply not real. But you're not going to be fixing it because the business value of simply fixing all, those all that technical debt, which is like entrenched in 15, 20 years of technology development is just too huge. You can, of course, pick some fights, and you should. You shouldn't just leave all of it, but you can pick some fights and try to fix that. You're not going to get that mainframe fixed. That's like $100 million or so to fix that. But you, you can do the small things, and you should do the small things. But every time you do that, you have to choose between making new stuff or fixing the old debts. And that's a hard decision. It's some of that money you're simply not going to get. So this talk is about learning to live with it. Okay, uh, I am a developer. I come from, a, I see this from a developer perspective. Um, and I work in projects, typical agile projects with empowered developers that take responsibility from defining what's supposed to be done, testing it and delivering it. And from my perspective, your team should feel really uneasy when the build is read. They should be like unwilling to go to lunch, unwilling to do anything but fix the build. Which means uh, your team members know they have a real problem when a test is read. And that's one of the real challenges we're going to be talking about here. Because all your backend systems are crap. Well, at least all the test ones are crap. <laughs> so uh, we need to have tight control of what a red test means. So what we want to do and how we practice uh, safe uh, software development to get high quality is to have developers build tests for every single use case and every single variation of absolutely everything. That includes every possible error handling scenario that is worthy to be described and quite a few ones that are not worthy to be described. So let no stone be untouched. And we also let all developers do every single bit of application development through testing. Uh, developers never run manual tests. So basically, uh, I've been working on this one same application for like five years, and I've never at one single point for at least the last three years uh, clicked through the application manually. I don't do that. We just do run through tests. So the good sign is when somebody moved the link from one page to another and 90% of your developers don't know how to get there if they're sort of asked to use the application. I know it's a, it's a, there's several sides to that, but in, in general, the developers actually don't have that intimate knowledge with the application because it's all test driven and it's all very thorough. And if you didn't do that feature, if you didn't move that link, well, you, probably don't know where it is because you didn't do anything manually. Now, an interesting consequence of delivering expected quality on time and budget and all that, uh, all those nice warm buzzwords, is that uh, what do we do with test? <laughs> what do we do with the testers? And uh, obviously, uh, we, we've had uh, lots of testers and they're always in the project, in the team participating. Uh, but in, at some point when you start delivering sufficiently good quality, uh, and do that for like, a sufficient <laughs> amount of time, uh, the enterprise decides that you, don't, you no longer need these testers because you're simply delivering quality right out of the box. So basically, they take them away from us. Uh, that, that's happened several times. We just lose the testers. We, we have them for a while, and we've got to use them while we have them, but um, in the end, you just lose your testers. They're taken away. They have other things that are much more flaky. I mean, I just told you how bad things are out there. So they need to test the other things, the ones that don't work. So to make out all this work, and this is what I want to talk about. How do we, how do we get this to work? Uh, we need all our tests to run really quickly. Anything above 15 minutes for running the whole thing is bad. Um, and it actually costs quite a lot of money too, because when the tests are read, we use practically every available resource to make it green again. 
which means we, 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 it has to be quick. And even if you're just waiting for the bill to be green again, well, that's, that's money out of the window. And there may actually be like five people waiting for that test to be green. So it has to be fast. And there are these untestable parts of systems where like 100% coverage or close to 100% coverage is really confidence building. You will see like um, developers who know their stuff is good because they have such extreme coverage. And it's not, it's not like technical coverage. It's the things that users see. We're not measure, measuring co coverage. We never do that. We could, but we don't. Uh, that, that's because the, you like, if you manage to entrench this culture within your projects, you don't need to do these measurements. So there is the thing of the red tests, because if you have just a handful of tests, say 10 of them that fail 5% of the time, your uh, continuous integration system is only going to be red about half the time, 52% or so. And that, you simply can't have that. So you will be spending quite a lot of energy uh, getting the correct amount of intermittent failures, which probably means something like 0.01% or less for every test. Because if you have a thousand tests with that rate, uh, one in 10 builds will actually fail for some mysterious reason. And ideally, that number should be one in 100. So I think the stability you're aiming for is really, really high. And of course, there's going to be some bad apples, which have to be sort of identified and fixed. So the problem of slow tests. Use the Selenium Grid or uh, Selenium as a service from a service provider. Just get lots of nodes up and run it all in parallel. Uh, so you can have those results back in, uh, I'd say, five minutes. That's a solid, a solid amount of time. And also make sure that uh, the developers have access to run the tests from local workstation so they can get response in five minutes which is equally important. Use continuous integration, which uh, runs, in our case, we don't run them hourly, we run them non-stop during daytime. We actually wrote a special plugin because <laughs> there is no option to run the tests non-stop <laughs> in our CI. So we just run them all the time, and the reason for that is we can get uh, very good statistics in the scope of just a single day to see which test is actually failing intermittently. So we can see if there's any problems we need to fix. And we allow the builds to break, because that's a part of the economy. We live in uh, the most expensive country in the world, and uh, a certain amount of build breaking just means that you're working at a good pace. But what does happen is if you do break the build, you have a build master, who is a round robin selected from the team, and he's sitting right next to you the moment the build is read with your name on it. So that, that just means you, 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 can't, you have to drop everything once you break the build. And we do also revert uh, anything that is unfixed for a certain amount of time. Uh, we try not to leave for home with a red build or eat lunch or anything like that. But the thing is, if you use the right tools, like Git or, or maybe some other distributed version control system, reverting isn't painful. It, it doesn't hurt like it does with Subversion or some other uh, older tool. <laughs> it's true, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we just use reverts as an ordinary mechanism for, for just getting back to the known good state. And it's, it's sometimes you can just, like, if you break 450 tests, uh, it's uh, cool to just revert the whole thing because we have such an enormous amount of tests. That's, that's the whole thing. So it's priority one, and you get usually one or two people sitting beside you until you fix it. That works. Now, there's all these impediments for testing. Um, there are APIs that you probably don't have in your regular core business because uh, when you test, you typically want to sort of complete the whole scenario in one go. And usually you will have to, in an enterprise environment, you, you will have to order those specifically and get them through the priority loop and, and get those things that you're actually missing. For, for instance, canceling orders may not be available uh, in in the way you need it, or just getting things back to the state where you want them, where you started. And the worst ones are probably asynchronous stuff. Uh, let's say you have an order process where something is just thrown on a message queue, and uh, it's processed in a batch manner and maybe sent to manual processing. That's a fairly common enterprise pattern for, uh, 
for handling orders because you want them to go through no matter what. So you, you do a minor verification and you throw it on a queue. So um, that probably means your test has to throw, so throw something on the queue too, if you actually want to verify that it happened 15 minutes later or whatever. That's, you just have to make these things testable, but even better if you can, you just discard them. Find something that is testable. And sometimes, like, a delete customer has this irritating ability to actually delete the customer. So maybe you need to have, uh, generate the customer first before you can delete it. It's just making sure things are repeatable. Um, now there's the obvious thing of uh, too many errors, and there's uh, Selenium bugs. And as we usually say in the error tra uh, issue tracker, when someone reports a bug against version 2.14, is that uh, we're not going to fix that. You need to go closer to the latest version because we've done a thousand things since then. And that's just wasted time. It's a consequence of open source, I think. So I advise you to stay close to the latest versions. And of course, if you find a bug, you fix it, submit a patch with a test case, which is just about how I entered into the project because we had so many bugs we were fixing. And the damn thing had to work, after all. <laughs> uh, and since we're talking extremely low error rates, uh, you work around using jQuery simulated events, prototype, whatever. I mean, if, there's, if something doesn't work, you just make sure it works, God damn it. Uh, so even if you're unable to fix the bug, you just have to make sure it works. And you sacrifice speed for correctness. Like we, for a number of versions, had problems with typing, where the typing events are not entirely accurate. Well, then you just check that you actually managed to type the right value in the field when you're done, and you repeat until you have managed to get the right data in, because you, you can't let that fail. If, it, if it's broken, you just have to find some workaround. I'm sorry, guys, but this is it's the way it works. And there's the test problems, where your tests uh, have various inconsistencies or race conditions uh, towards the DOM. When is that DOM page loaded? Uh, every, if anyone has ever tried clicking an element that is actually moving on screen, that, that, is, that is fairly interesting if you're like using visual effects or moving or fading things in and out. So you will basically end up instrumenting your Java code, your JavaScript code, and your application in general to, uh, to determine when the stable state of the equilibrium, the testable stable state, has arrived. You need to do that. And you need zero tolerance for intermittent issues, which means you just sit there and you sit there in a pair. This is a pair programming activity, not by yourself. If a test is failing and you don't know why, sit down, two people, and find the root cause. It works. It's at least 10 times faster than finding it by yourself. At least if you've looked at it like three times before trying to <laughs> find the problem. So uh, that's a pair programming issue. Data errors are another whole category of problems. Um, what you would typically do is run, make some kind of test data locator that identifies data with the given characteristics, like find customer with unpaid bills. Simple method, right? And what that does is basically find some way into the data sources for the system and find a customer like that. Now, you use this customer. So what, what, what the test data locator also has to do is if this customer doesn't have a login for the application, it has to make one. It just has to make sure everything works. So what you do is you go into the backend system, find some data that looks, looks correct. And every now and then, uh, you can also make the test data locator uh, introduce randomness into the result. If you, um, and you can actually choose that. If you look for a customer with unpaid bills, do you always want to get the same customer, or do you want to get a different one every time? And actually, getting a different one every time is quite smart, because every now and then, something's going to break the test or the application or whatever, because you're hitting live data, different versions all the time. And sometimes the data is actually driving the problem. So if you have randomness in which data is being tested, you will eventually, and after a quite short time, weed out all the, all the strange issues. OK, uh, I'm a Java developer, but this applies to most of the most of the other test technologies too. You can use stuff like JUnit categories, test in G groups, to sort of tag tests, and try to partition your whole domain into uh, groups, more or less by stability. 
So you can choose to run, uh, instead of one failing, like a large blob of tests that have a, a random set of failing tests, you can split them so that some of them are always green. And if they fail, you know right away that something is seriously wrong. Uh, and some of the more troublesome can be isolated. So you can sort of manage to keep focus of, of what is important and what is not important. Uh, we have actually a rather interesting payoff from this because it, it helps. It helps a lot. So if you have a huge set of tests that are just failing too much, this might be a very interesting strategy. And there is the other one, which is stubbing. Uh, if your backend systems are just wasted, replace them with hard-coded fakes. What you will do with that, and that this is basically the reason why we can have 100% coverage. I'm not, I'm not strict about that. We don't have 100%. We have, we have uh, extremely high coverage. But uh, I haven't measured, so I wouldn't know what it is. <laughs> But I know we have 100%, and that's because we have stubbed out most of the significant uh, parts of the back end. So we know that for this segment of the application, we have more or less 100% coverage. For other parts of the application, we don't have that kind of coverage. Um, some architecture diagrams are called for. This is uh, what Evans would call an um, anti-corruption layer. It's a Java thing. But the thing is that you interface through your external systems down here with, uh, with, through a set of interfaces which have an inter implementation. And uh, out of those interfaces up into the actual application, you only have model objects flowing from your own applications. Which means that you're not exposing all the web services and all the stuff happening down here. It's totally invisible to the core business logic and the web layer and all that. They, they only see model objects you've written in your own code. Now, the thing about that is that you can replace that whole layer and all of your backend systems, or as many as you like, with fake <coughs> stub implementations. And if those stubs somehow actually capture uh, the real complexity of your domain, uh, you can write a lot of the tests towards those stubs. Now, let's see how we would do that. One thing you could do is define a data set, which is like uh, one customer, one login in your domain. Now, this, is, this represents a hard-coded user. He has some login credentials, an address maybe, maybe some subscriptions and some bills. And behind this, we have an implementation that is basically just a hard-coded version. Now, what you can do is, uh, on the top right here, you can actually connect this hard-coded uh, implementation to your session when you log in and you can have the stub ask the session for what is the logged in user which means you can support uh, multiple different uh, fake users which is important because you can't just do one data set and getting these data sets uh, properly and cleanly implemented turns out to be a lot harder than one could think it's really easy to make a l huge mess we'll look at that later so a typical stub like a billing service would do something like get bills. Now, I'll let you read the code, but this billing system has this interesting thing that uh, in real life, it's a bit flaky. So like 10% or so of the time or so, it just fails. And that's a known characteristic of the production system. So we implement that in the stub. And in general, we can... So what you see here is this just counts. Every 10th transaction, we just do something stupid. Uh, and otherwise, we just go to the data set, which is bound to the session, and, and we get uh, some bills, which is for this customer. Now, there is a whole lot of different things you can do here, but the general idea is to try to encapsulate uh, the real behavior of external system. And we also treat the stubs uh, like first-class citizens in the software environment, so we report bugs against them, we make issues, we fix them, we improve them, make them more realistic, simply because they, they uh, if, if a stub doesn't reflect the behavior of the real system or the real component, it, it doesn't do the trick for us. It will, so there's some anti-patterns to stubbing. Uh, first of all, we put our stubs in one architectural layer. And uh, a lot of, I, I talk to a lot of people who do this, and uh, we, we, we've done it wrong a couple of times too, and it's very easy to make the stubs creep into different layers of the application, 
They can creep up into like a business logic layer or even like up to the web layer. But in general, if you just try to make all the stubbing ha happen at the same architectural layer, you will save a lot of uh, time and uh, trouble in the future. And there is the issue of normalization because um, this interface doesn't really represent, well, it represents a login account. But if you get a lot of, uh, a lot of mock data, you should probably try to normalize this interface uh, slightly more so you don't like make a big, big blob of an object that serves every single aspect of this one login. So it's probably uh, better to try to normalize the stub. I'm not getting into that. So there's a coverage issue. Now, since we write tests that are used extensively towards stubs, we can Selenium test the whole application without any live integration at all, and we can do that at close to 100%, good enough for all practical purposes. Then we can add integration tests on the side here, which uh, will test the live system. And in between here, we see we have like a, a small hole, which is that we're not testing the full stack. We're testing stubs, we're testing the services. So what we do is we also have a set of live Selenium tests that use the same page objects as the stubs, because it's the same application, but we run on a live stack instead. We actually use that as a, as a production ver verification test too, so we can run these in, in live as part of uh, continuous deployment to production to verify that production is acting properly. So uh, we smoke tests, but these tests are just uh, these tests are exposed to all the uh, nastiness <laughs> of test data, uh, things being removed. And in, in production, it's even worse because in production you won't have expo ex you won't have ac access to a lot of those uh, APIs that can let you find things. Because part of the thing is we we encapsulate things to hide things, and these are the things we need to test things. So. Uh, so we have just uh, the smallest amount of live tests we can get away with, with um, because they're a pain to maintain. So in all, you end up with an approximation where the live tests go through the whole stack in live. You have the integration tests, which tests only the services, and there is the subtest, which I haven't shown in the figure. It gives a coverage which you can discuss at infinite lengths, <laughs> is this good? Uh, is this the way you want to have it? Well, probably not, but it works extremely well. And we know this because we've deployed to production consecutively for years without any significant breakages. And we also keep very clear records of when we have a breakage that is actually sort of rooted in this design. Because, I mean, we, we all understand there are holes in this, but... Uh, and it's only happened like a couple of times, as far as I can remember. We can say that this is because we didn't like that. And we need to communicate to our customers, that is the, uh, the people who pay for this software and, and uh, order functionality to uh, uh, where the restrictions are and, or when the tests don't do their job anymore. And uh, they let us skip most of the manual testing because we were so much better than everyone else in the organization. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it was definitely far better than anything they had already. And um, so that's like the practical perspective of this. Uh, see. Yep. We have five minutes left for questions. It seems to me that there's a general theme here between these presentations that for us to be able to test effectively that we have to actually instrument our applications for test, right? And I think you've reiterated that again. Yeah, I think so too. It's um, a lot of monitoring going on. And uh, if you want to test things like Google Analytics, or whatever analytics stuff you're doing, you're going to be instrumenting big time anyway. We test that too, by the way. We, there is, 
almost <laughs> we test several different logging and analytics systems and it's all monitored and tested. So uh, I think you need to make a suitable runtime mode for your application that is, is with instrumentation. I think that's it's just necessary, no matter what. Okay, any others? Yeah, how easy or difficult was it for you to uh, get the buy-in about creating APIs which is just exposed or used by the test and not by the business? Because we find it sometimes difficult and get an argument saying that if this API is not going to be used for the business, then people have different reasons to say no to that. One of them is it's extra code. Second, it's probably risky that you are exposing behavior which should not be exposed. I, um, the way I understand your question is how do you get priority for making those features that allow you to test your code? Yeah, especially towards backend systems. And my experience is that you do it, make sure you do it early in the project while the project is young and fresh and has influence and resources to actually get things done. Because like the further into production you come and uh, the further out of focus your project goes, you, uh, the harder it gets. But if you do it while you're the hottest thing around, you will generally get it done. That's a, <laughs> I'm sorry, it doesn't help you if you're not there anymore, but every project is there from time to time. Okay. Uh, question around continuous integration. Uh, how important is to uh, keep your build clean always? Say, for example, you got the huge uh, test, test, uh, test suite, and you know that one particular test is uh, go going to fail and cause the, your build raid. So is it important to keep uh, our continuous integrate and build always green, or we should allow to build to fail every time? Our integration tests are a mess. They never work. Because we actually, those are related to those systems that are just totally messed up, in test at least. And uh, there is a saying, if your systems are that messed up in test, it's probably bad in production too, but fortunately, it's a little bit better in production, but uh, it, it's not good. And, uh, uh, but uh, so the integration tests, uh, I think that's part of what we did with the annotations and the splitting. Uh, we had so many tests that were failing on the integration side that we had to try to identify what is actually stable, what can we do something about, which tests do we simply have to give up. But on the Selenium tests, which actually tests the end user experience, we have absolute zero tolerance, and, and it's, you're not getting away with that, breaking that. <laughs> so uh, I think that's, uh, I think that's as uh, well as I can uh, respond to that question. So I think, but picking your fights is important here, and uh, I think that's the essence, really. Um, you say that, um when, so when a developer breaks the build, he, he's, there's two people come and sit next to him. Well, what happens if he's introduced a change that breaks the test? It doesn't matter. Wh whatever, whatever reason the build breaks for, and we're totally uncritical about that. Let's say uh, the grid node that was running the test just crashed. It's still his problem. So we don't care about the reason. Uh, you fix the reason. I mean, either there's a functionality change, that's fine, we do that all the time. There's a test change, well, we do that all the time too. But uh, so basically, we're not auditing the reason for why that test is read. We're just getting him to fix it now. That's, that's sort of the in-team policy of driving, driving uh, the test attitude. Uh, and, and the interesting thing about that is that you, you see that uh, once you're strict enough about this, the whole team starts relying on this and they become uneasy when it's, uh, they don't like it at all when things are broken. So, so you don't even have to appoint an extra person often. We have a build master, we do that on a rotated basis, but uh, quite often there's going to be one or two more other people showing up too if you break the build, which is all right. And, and if you just decide to revert, that's cool too. Uh, you, know, you were efficient by just doing that one small change and you just commit to that, maybe even without running tests, we think that's okay. But it didn't work, so let's get back to stable. That's, uh, I don't know if I answered that, but. <laughs> so, uh, 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 
Ultimately, it is his responsibility. Ultimately, it's the developer's responsibility to, even if he's not necessarily the one that needs to change something, well, we're, to get that change made. Is that what you're saying? We're agile teams. So we take responsibility from requirements to deployment, which means that if the requirements somehow changed or something broke, that's our responsibility, no matter. There is no escaping that responsibility. And since we all feel so bad when the test is broken, we just all like pitch in to, to get that thing, uh, to get those tests fixed. That's <laughs> well, as I also said, we, that it's about keeping the build green. I think if you're, close, if you're a close-knit team, uh, you don't have to do that in the same sense. But if you're distributed across like thousands of offices or the whole universe, you, you, you have to like think about that. But if you're a close-knit team, it's a common responsibility and you should treat it as that, which means that you can actually use the build uh, to save time as well. So. Um, but that, that, that would change if we all like spread over across the whole company and, and had different offices, different locations and all stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. So um, I think the, the concept, the, the, the chat about keeping the build green is endlessly fascinating, particularly for people who are at this conference. Um, so why don't we say thank you very much to Christian. <laughs> Um, and there's just a quick short break um, before the next presentations. Okay, thank you guys.